My name is Fred Michael Brick Amram. Uh, I was born in Hanover, Germany. Mm -hmm. um, I'm an only child. Uh, my father was a peddler, essentially. He sold uh, dry goods, textiles. My mother was a, uh, a housewife. Before she married my father, she was a bookkeeper for an uncle who had a butcher shop. Um, I was born in a Catholic infant's home. And uh, you may be surprised that a Jewish baby would be born in a Catholic infant's home. Mm -hmm. However, already by that time, by the time I was born, uh, what, eight and a half months after Hitler became chancellor, uh, health care for Jewish women was, was hard to come by. And the Jewish hospitals were closed, and access to the public hospitals was difficult. Uh, and there was an order of nuns that accepted Jewish women. Uh, so I was born in this uh, infant's home. Uh, my birth certificate, in fact, is signed by a mother superior, mm -hmm. uh, which... Do you remember I, which order of nuns? I it? don't remember. I have no idea. Um, they tell the story of my bris, my, uh, my circumcision, which, uh, as you know, is a big deal for Jews. And uh, we had a, a major celebration at our apartment uh, because I was the only son, certainly the firstborn, but as it turned out, no others were born. But of all my cousins and uncles and aunts, uh, I was the only male child. Mm -hmm. And so it was a big deal to have uh, of this breast. And then there... In, at least in our apartment, there was about to be a, a banquet, or at least a buffet, where the cousins and the uncles and all the people, the relatives who had come from great distances. Uh, my Aunt Beta had come from Berlin, and my Uncle Max had come from Hamburg. And uh, they were all there, and it was a big deal. And we heard marching outside our, our, our apartment. We lived on the fourth floor of a five-story building. And we rushed out uh, to the balcony and looked off the balcony. And indeed, there was a parade uh, of soldiers and, uh, and a lot of people lined up on the streets. And uh, my uncle, who was the family tease, Uncle Max, said, see, they're having a celebration for this Jewish baby. Not very likely. But he, uh, and so we were excited about the parade for the Jewish baby. I am told, I'm only eight days old now. Um, after a few units of soldiers, there was an open limousine, or an open car, and in the car was a man with a mustache standing. And as he came under our balcony, uh, the, the people along the street suddenly said, Heil Hitler! And it was. Adolf Hitler had come to my bris, my circumcision. And uh, that story in our family is told over and over and over. Uh, there he was. He came to the party. One day, one of the benches had a sign on it. And although I couldn't read well, uh, Jewish kids weren't allowed to go to school, to public school, I was able to make out the words. It said, Nur für Juden, only for Jews. 
And as a six-year-old, I thought that was really cool. There was a bench just for me. <laughs> but then the next week, all the other benches had signs that said, Nur für Aria, only for Aryans. Mm. And uh, so I was less pleased. In the early days, in the mid-30s, it was still possible to leave Germany. It wasn't always easy to get into other countries, but one of the places that we had access to was Holland, which at that time was quite free. And my mother had a sister who had married uh, a Dutch man. And so the, at least we could go to Holland. Uh, there were other countries that accepted Jews, but my father wouldn't leave. He kept saying, this too will pass. It'll go away. It couldn't be that bad. And it kept getting worse. 1937 or 8, the Gestapo started coming regularly to our apartment. Uh, they would come with their uniforms and their guns and uh, and they would ask about my father and my father was always gone. Somehow he had a way of knowing that the Gestapo was about to look for him. I found out later that he went to the second floor in our apartment building, and he hid under the bed of some Christians, some righteous Christians, righteous Gentiles. Um, he would, he never would tell me then, because you can't trust a little boy. Mm. But even after the war, uh, he wouldn't tell me who these people were. He was still protecting them. My father came home quite disheveled. Uh, he had been traced through his license, his driver's license plates, and uh, and they had taken him to slave labor, and as I understand it, they told him that he was going to be working on road construction and that he could go home overnight. But if he didn't come back, then he and his family would all be killed. Uh, we visited the woman who, the cousin, the, um, my aunt who lived in Holland with her, her husband, um, Isaac, Isaac Wumps, and they had just had, they had had a baby, several months old. My only first cousin, her name was Altje, Altje Wumps, and it was the only time I got to play with Altje, uh, as much as one can play with a, an infant. My aunt Kate and her husband, Uncle Isaac, and their little girl, Altje, my only cousin, at the age of three and a half, uh, died in Auschwitz in the gas chambers and the crematoria. And we have been able to verify that. To this day, I can say to you, if there is a God who did this to the Jews or to any other people, and other more than Jews were involved, if there is God who did this, then I don't want to know that God. But I can't believe that um, that there, yeah. I just believe in uh, 
nature, science, uh, the world is. I believe in statistics. You know, things are accidental. I, I told you how they had this sign uh, on, on the bench that said, Nur für Juden, for Jews only. The other bench is Nur für Aria, for Aryans only. When I came to the United States, I saw water fountains that said, for colored only, for white only. I saw bathrooms, toilets, said for colored only, for white only. It can happen anywhere, at any time. And I think everybody, as you suggest, should, should worry, what would I do if I were there? I lived in New York City, and no matter where I turned, I, I was a loser. Uh, there was anti-Semitism, and I often was chased, uh, you know, are you Jewish? And if I said yes, they'd beat me up. If I said no, they'd look, look and see I was carrying a book with Hebrew writing on it. Um, Fortunately, I was able to run very fast. My sport in high school was, was track. Um, I would run away a lot. So yeah, there was a lot of anti-Semitism. There was a lot in school, even in grade school, uh, when people called me a Jew or a dirty Jew. and all What of kind of a school did you go to? A New York City school. Like what's that Manhattan public school, right? public school. Yeah. However, the other f side of that was it was during the war. And so if I wasn't Jewish, I spoke with an accent and I was German oh. and the Germans were the enemy of, in the war. They were called the Huns. And so I was either a Hun or a Jew. And uh, yes, in, in New York, there was still anti-Semitism. What there wasn't was the fear of the Gestapo. What there wasn't was adequate food, jobs for my parents, um, general freedom. But on the street, on the street, there was a lose-lose situation, either a Jew or a Hun. I couldn't win during the war. And just today I was telling someone that their story is dying out because all of those people who were in Dachau, in Auschwitz, are now either dead because they were in the gas chambers and the crematoria, or they're very old because they kept them alive at Auschwitz for slave labor. If I had been taken to Auschwitz at age six, uh, I would have immediately been killed because uh, I was of no use to anyone. So there are very few people my age uh, who went to concentration camps and survived. The people who were somewhat older, who were useful in Auschwitz, that is, could be used, or at Dachau, or at other camps, um, those people are, are older than I am and dying. Uh, on my next birthday, I'll be 80. The people who actually experienced Auschwitz are more like 90. And so the story that I tell is really of another generation and it will be the next picture of the, the Holocaust in a sense. That is, the people who were in, in the camps uh, won't be able to tell their own story anymore. And 10 years from now, when my generation is gone, There'll be nobody left to tell the story. That is to tell the story firsthand. Okay, we can 
we can end it here. So you can um, wait. You tell me if I can come yeah. up and look. Uh, yeah. You know, Felix, Sandra and I play a game when we go to the art museum uh -huh. and we see famous portraits, wonderful artwork, Rembrandt, and then we say, if someone were to paint your portrait, mm -hmm. how would you like it to look? What would you wear? <laughs> and I think when there comes to be a portrait of me, and we make up new stories each time. And so I was thinking today, I would like my portrait to be in shining armor and with a helmet. I would like to be a knight. Mm. So I hope you painted me as a knight in shining armor. <laughs> I won't say anything. <laughs> All right, so you can say, uh, let's come here. You can see, oh, maybe. No, I can see it. Yeah. It looks can't be like. Can't then, so then mm -hmm. you will have better because it's a bit better. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. from here. The reflection, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. It looks like I see myself, a chubby old man. Excellent. Yeah, it looks like a likeness. It doesn't show me as a knight in shining armor. Oh, that, that remains to be seen. Hmm? That that's in the eyes of the viewer. I see. Let me see. Uh, nor am I dressed as a sa as a sailor. No, I, I once suggested I'd I think like you to look be in knightly. scuba gear. Well, that's a whole different story. <laughs> I think you look knightly. Okay. Cool. Yeah, pretty cool. Wonderful. All right, thank you very much. Yeah.